like you, I, I do want to leave the world a slightly better place. You know, if somebody reads a travel article and can go on a trip um, that I've done and enjoy it, I, I love that. If they can't travel and they can just enjoy living, you know, traveling vicariously by reading something, that that makes me really happy. Hi, this is Frank Schaefer, and you are listening to and or watching In Conversation with Frank Schaefer, a podcast that I do and is produced by Ernie Gregg, my producer. And today um, I'm talking with someone whose work I follow, uh, and that is a writer, Melanie D.G. Kaplan or Melanie Kaplan or Melanie. Um, I have a lot of material on her. I'm going to introduce her properly in terms of the writing she does, the subjects she covers, and all the rest of that, I have her uh, website open so I can not forget that she also writes about road trips as well as dogs and technology and all sorts of interesting things. But um, so welcome, Melanie. We, we will talk about a lot of stuff here, but thank you for coming on. Thank you, Frank. It's really nice to be here. Yeah. So let me jump in at an odd place, um, just showing that I have a little inside knowledge. You're working on a book and or you've completed it. Um, when we last talked, just a private conversation, we mentioned the fact that we'll have to do another podcast when the book comes out to push it, because obviously, when you write for newspapers like the Washington Post and the New York Times and CNN, people are interested in those articles, but there's nothing to really um, kind of promote other than just promoting you as a writer. So what's the latest on the book in terms of when when it might be out? So... Um... I'm, I'm going to save most of this for our next conversation. Yes, I know. But, um, yeah. but but it will be out in 2025. Okay, good. So let me let me give you a little bit of an introduction here um, that is going to be odd for you. And that is that uh, I am working on a book, which I am not promoting today because it's not out either. <laughs> <laughs> but my agent is trying to sell it as we speak. I've just sent her a completed manuscript. So it's done. But I, I just want to read something to you, which then I've never done this before, by the way, on any podcast I've ever done in an interview. But the way I want to introduce you is by reading a little section out of this book. And you are mentioned a lot in the book. I use you as a resource. I quote you. But here's where we first meet you. And I'll read to you. No matter what is done to them, dogs will try to connect with humans. Journalist Melanie D.G. Kaplan is one of the best writers on animals around, in my humble opinion. In My Beagle Hammy was used in, research lab, in a research lab for his first four years of his life. I'm so lucky to be his therapy human. Washington Post, May 29, 2021. She writes about Hammy, a dog she rescued from a university laboratory. And now I quote you. Alexander Hamilton is an 11-year-old beagle who spent his first four years in a testing laboratory. Not to ruin your day, but you should know that university and private labs still experiment on tens of thousands of dogs. Many of them are beagles, and many of the beagles arrive as puppies. The majority come from breeders who sell directly to the testing facilities, according to the Humane Society of the United States. Imagine taking the softest, most innocent and compliant being and putting him in a cage prison for years. Hammy was petrified. There's ellipses here. I condense a little bit. Hammy was petrified, rarely leaving his bed and scared of everything. He had the naivete of a toddler and the frights of a prisoner of war. After years in a cage, his legs were so underdeveloped, uh, undeveloped that I had to teach him to climb stairs and hop on a couch. He couldn't bark because his vocal cords had been cut, apparently a common practice in some labs to prevent howling. Even his sense of smell, a beagle's superpower, was weak. So I hid treats, encouraging him to exercise his sniffer muscles. On one of our first car outings, he ducked when we drove beneath an underpass and again when I turned on the windshield wipers. And I know that's an odd introduction. And by the way, I quote you about another, or mention you about a dozen times in this book, because I love your writing on um, animals. And my book is related to human relationships and dogs. That's it. I'm not saying more about it. Um, but um, I found you to be so inspiring in terms of, of 
trying to write in a way that both gives information, but also the love you have for your dog. Um, and I'll just be very, you know, kind of sentimental here, but that comes through in terms of who you are as a person that I found in reading what you write about your travels and your dogs and how you look at these things, um, a tremendous level of kind of empathy and compassion comes through. So by the time I'd finished reading some of your articles, you know, you're someone who you'd have to be a pretty cold hearted reader to come away not really liking you. I really like you and I only know you through your writing. So that's an odd introduction, but take it or leave it. Gosh, I I am so touched by that. Thank you for your kind words. And, you know, it's um it's unusual for me in that I I don't ever get to hear someone else reading my words. And and so hearing what I wrote about Hammy almost 10 years ago, or, or what I wrote about his experience almost 10 years ago is yeah. um yeah, was was really um interesting and a little emotional to to hear that from somebody else yeah well i follow your stories and i i i have other passages that i talk about in my book where you wrote something for cnn and so forth and so i don't really want to use that as the guide to to track what you've done i just want to talk to sort of give a more general introduction that you've you, you know looking at your website here so i don't forget stuff you write about dogs you put the occasional pig sport Planes, trains, um, airstreams, travel, cities, song, dance, art, people, gallery. <laughs> you have beautiful photographs, by the way. You take wonderful pictures, archives, food and drink. Uh, you know, I'm being a little facetious when I say it would be easier to come up with a list of what Melanie doesn't write about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think so, I, I think I might have told you last time we talked that I don't write about politics. So okay. That must- Probably pretty short, but that's, that's and that's refreshing, by the way, because you know <laughs> on this podcast we talked to a lot of people and it's politics all the way down. But um, it's so lovely to 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 read your writing. You know, one of the stories you wrote was sort of recreating Steinbeck's travels with Charlie. You took off across the country. Talk about that a little bit. What was that journey all about? Mm. Well, so the the first cross country drive I did was with my previous Beagle Darwin. And I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, you know, now I feel like it's it's old hat. I know the different routes to get out there and where I want to go. But it was such an adventure. And, you know, my my grandmother lived in Southern California. So that was often the impetus for me to set out. And so we just we stopped along the way to see friends. We stopped um, when we saw a park or an attraction. And when we got to the West Coast, we were actually up in the Pacific Northwest. And I remember getting to the beach there and seeing the Pacific and just crying. And Darwin was running along the beach with me. And um, it was it was just fantastic. I felt so free. And to this day, I mean, I've done this probably a dozen times coast to coast. And once I pass the middle of the country, you know, if I'm up north, it's kind of past Wisconsin, the sky just opens up and the roads open up and I've passed Chicago traffic. And it's um, it's one of my favorite things. Let me jump into a, a more conventional introduction here. Again, this is uh, this is Frank Schaefer within conversation with Frank Schaefer, and you may be listening to this as a podcast somewhere or watching it online live on Facebook or looking at it on YouTube, wherever you see it, by the way, please like it in the online interweb sense and share it and all those good things. Um, but I'm going to just read here from your bio on your own website, um, which, by the way, we're going to post how people reach you, put your website up so we don't have to spell all that out. But it'll be wherever this is. People will be able to reach out to you. Melanie uh, is a 2021-22 MIT Night Science Journalism Project Fellow and a 2022 Vermont Law School Media Fellow. She graduated from Syracuse University Newhouse School of Public Communication and Columbia Journalism School and has been freelancing for 25 years covering travel science and animals. 
She's written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, U.S. News and World Report, People, National Parks, Reader's Digest. She has been interviewed. Uh, she has interviewed Miss Piggy, uh, John, uh, Bon Jovi, uh, mm-hmm. Laird Hamilton, Isabella Rossellini. That's one I'm interested in. Allison, Janet, Katie Couric, uh, who interviewed me, by the way, one time. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Alan Greenspan, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then there's more third generation Washingtonian, et cetera. But the the main thing I I think uh, I'm so interested in in talking about is just the profession that you have. Um, I'm presuming that you have earned a living doing this because you're so prolific. I always hesitate to ask that because people always assume somehow someone that's published in the New York Times and Washington Post and all this other fancy stuff is earning a living at it. So this is a very pedestrian question, but have you managed to earn a living as a writer, period? And has this been going on for 25 years? Because that's a steep climb right there. It's a tough, tough one. Yeah, I, I appreciate that question because it's something that I talk to my my fellow uh, journalists about quite a bit. And at the beginning, I had for probably the first decade, I was working part time somewhere, and it was partly for the money and partly just to get me away from my computer and around other humans because. You know, I could just work all day long. And so I, I worked teaching swimming classes and I worked at a used bookstore for many years here on Capitol Hill. Um, my very first job was as a hostess at a restaurant in Atlanta. That's when I first started freelancing. So that that definitely was important to supplement my income. And, you know, I have to say I I, I don't have children and if I did, and if I was the primary breadwinner, I, I would not be able to do what I've done. You know, I, I live very um, leanly and frugally, and and I make it work. Mm. And, you know, I'm interested. You know, you're in Washington D.C. Are you there right now? Are we talking to you in Washington? We are. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and so, here's a journalist in Washington. Just wanted to make sure you were there. Um, we're talking to journalists in Washington who's says the one thing I'm not going to talk about and what I don't do is writing on <laughs> politics. I, you know, you you must be the only one. Uh maybe there was another one who got hit by a truck on Thursday, but that's a pretty <laughs> rare breed. Uh how does you know, when someone asks me, well, what are you hoping to do with your writing other than earn a living? Um, with your books, you know, with the fiction, I want to tell a good story with the nonfiction, do the best I can to be, you know, tell the truth. And maybe in a way that leaves my reader in a better place on some subject than they were when Mm. they got there makes the world a more humane and kind place. I see that very much as a thread in your writing. Um, You're, you're, you're a very humane person. Talk about the treatment of animals. You don't sort of get, um, you know, there's not an aspect of a cause, but there <laughs> there is between the lines. Um, so you're not doing politics, but obviously when you're talking about the treatment of animals, that's an issue, if not a political issue per se. How, how do you see what you are achieving with the writing? Like you, I, I do want to leave the world a slightly better place. You know, if somebody reads a travel article and can go on a trip um, that I've done and enjoy it. I I love that. If they can't travel and they can just enjoy living, you know, traveling vicariously by reading something that, that makes me really happy. And I, I have not ever been an activist. I have really been, you know, growing up, I was, I was really shy. I was the one not asking questions in the back of the classroom and and so I think my more more recent pieces where where I'm taking a stand with Hammy, my beagle, um, that comes, I think, just from years of gaining confidence in what I have to say. Mm. Because for a long time, I would have a story idea and dismiss it really quickly. And I think I think it was an editor who once told me, if you think something's interesting and if you're intrigued by something or curious, chances are other people will too. And, and that really helps 
just in terms of shifting my mindset on things mm. and and believing more in my ideas and and since I started writing more about Hammy, I've gotten a lot more feedback from people from readers that that just reinforces the fact that that people have just an insatiable appetite for stories about dogs and and the bond that we have with them and and the love that we have them which mm. will bode well for your book <laughs> as yeah, well yeah and and yours too without diving into it and we'll come yeah. back and talk about it but what interests me um with you too I, I you quoted somebody that we interviewed the other day on this uh show if you want to call this a show and that's Jessica Pierce who who's a bioethicist and so forth and of course she makes more of a cause in her, the orientation of hers, because she's writing about ethics and animal treatment and so forth. Um, but I find that your approach in terms of telling the story of Hammy and your experiences as a, a dog person, a person, a dog's person, you know, is, is, is beautiful writing, but it also in a way is um, unbearably poignant because now you're getting to know Hammy and sort of suffering with Hammy as he is rehabilitated by you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this isn't just some abstract thing that their vocal cords are getting cut somewhere and maybe grow back or not. This is a dog that you've made my friend. Mm -hmm. I've gotten to know him. And I love this piece that I read more recently about how to help an older dog, you know, in terms of, of uh, you know, putting non, non slip surfaces and this kind of thing. So vicariously living through your friendship with this one dog in a way is a kind of an issue or cause in that if we all felt about the animals we were close to and 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 through them began to have some empathy for other animals who were not as close to us it would change the way a lot of things happen i don't want to put words in your mouth but i just wonder how far you're going to follow that out in your writing in your own interests Hmm. In term in terms of our the connection with our animals and and animals that are you know beyond our yeah I mean the world around us and how we connect with mm. everything as seen through the lens of this one deep friendship right you know I think it's I think it's something that anybody who has ever loved an animal can can relate to i mean certainly our connection with our dogs and cats and and other pets has changed over the years and and people are deeply bonded i mean hammy hammy is is my family and um and you know i think that's it's an important thing for us to look at because that you know, it, show, it shows the capacity that we do have for mm -hmm. loving other, you know, non-human animals mm -hmm. um, and and just being passionate about about other beings and um, particularly those that have had rough beginnings. I mean, anyone with a rescue dog that's experienced any kind of trauma, not in a testing lab or a research lab necessarily, but but, you know, all the people who've adopted animals who've had had rough backgrounds um they can relate to that story i think how how far drawn have you been into you know the the sciencey bits as it were of dog human relationships and just the evolution of how dogs have managed to domesticate us so successfully for thousands <laughs> of years which seems to be where the actual science is pointing um you know that's not a fanciful notion uh in in writing about your dogs and your experiences and travel with them, I I see that you quote other people like Jessica Pierce and others. I think Alexander Horowitz perhaps is someone you quoted, or maybe you know I've been reading that. There are lots of people who've written on this subject from a more science perspective. I'm just wondering, this personal curiosity, how drawn into some of the work of other writers you've been on this particular subject of relationships with dogs or pets in general or whatever it might be. And the evolution of the dog human relationship. Yeah, I, I love this topic and and I'm learning more about it um all the time. I mean, I, I love Jessica's writing and Alexander Horowitz is is just, you know, amazing in her work. Um, you know, what I've 
been reading a little bit more about recently is is just some of the diseases that dogs and humans share. And it's interesting to think about how how that evolved too, because they've been with us. And so if we, you know, if we have um, cancers because of our environment, well, they're in this same environment. I mean, they're drinking the same water and they're smelling the same chemicals or walking on the same lawns that have been fertilized. And so it's it's not surprising that that we are we're so similar to them. Yeah, I, I, in, in, you know, I'm looking forward to reading your book on, on this and go, going further into it. But one of the things that I'm wondering in terms of your overall person writing and where you're coming from is your, your background all the way back into childhood. You know, sometimes I've written some memoir type books. So people I talk to kind of know that I came out of a right wing evangelical background. I left it. I'm very much on the other side now when it comes to many issues, but still very interested in spirituality. So I sort of go somewhere where I don't even think it's legal in job interviews to ask people about religion or, or you know, gender or anything else much these days. Apparently, everything's off limits that actually is interesting about someone <laughs> if you are hiring them, but I'm not hiring you. So <laughs> I want to know, I want to be a little bit pushy here and say, you know, who are you from the point of view of of your your background i'm someone still in in reaction recovery but also deeply in love with some of the good aspects of the community i was raised in a, a weird little religious community called labrie fellowship and out of that came you know my relationship with my wife Jeannie, and we got pregnant as teenagers and that's 53 years ago and we're still kind of together and i do a whole grandchild thing but that stuff is inextricably linked to my writing just what that editor told you, if something interests you, mm. you know, and obviously recovery from certain types of religious background. So, you know, I had my my memoir, Crazy for God, came out about 15 years ago. And after I it, it, it began to get out there, I started getting invitations from groups dealing with, for instance, uh, Jewish people in New York City who were recovering from having been raised in an ultra orthodox community where maybe they as a woman, they weren't even educated and they'd run away from it. But because I had a as a kind of a thing on my own passage from that background, all of a sudden they're inviting me to speak to their group. So, you know, it's odd how this all goes out. And I'm sure you find that with writing about dogs and travel. All of a sudden you're hearing from people and their connections. So mm -hmm. I just want to dive in here and see what you will tell me about your own background, your childhood, who your parents were, where you were raised, how all this developed. And now you're a writer. You were, you mentioned a little bit, you said you were kind of shy uh, growing up. Um, you know, what's, what's the journey that you would tell in the first chapter of a memoir? Um, if you were, if you decided to ever go there, which you may or may not want to do if you're, if you're shy about these things. Right, right. Um, well, now that we know that this is not a job interview, thank goodness. <laughs> Right. Um, let's see. So my my father was in the army. He was stationed in Germany. And this is important because when my parents moved back to the States before I was born, they brought home a little Volvo sports car and, and a dachshund, a long haired dachshund. Uh, hence my intro introduction to hounds. And uh, so we grew up with that dachshund Heidi and we Heidi had puppies. And I grew up in, uh, I was born in DC, grew up in suburban Maryland. And my father um, has been and continues to be a ham radio engineer. And he has had a business selling, buying and selling ham radio equipment. And there apparently is still a market for it. <laughs> um, so I think that that modeled for me just the, you know, the, the life, a life where you can be independent and work for yourself and, and work alone. And for better or for worse, I, I don't always love relying on other people. Um, teamwork is in some ways interesting to me, but I'm definitely an introvert. So, you know, I do all the recharging by myself and, um, and, you know, I think for my childhood and adult life, I've created a whole world that's that doesn't rely on other people for getting for getting work done, um, and 
So yes, I grew up in suburban Maryland. I have a younger sister. We had the Dachshunds and I lived there until I went off to college. Um, I also spent a lot of my childhood in a ballet studio. I was going to ballet classes probably five times a week and developed from that just a pretty, um, pretty rigid discipline of of exercising and, and working out. It's just the first thing I have to do every morning before I get my day started. Hmm. Well, there we are. Now we'll, we know how, how, how much of a deep dive you'll take into personal. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you, I will, uh, add, yeah. I will yeah. add uh, since you, since you mentioned religion, um, yeah, religion was not a big part of my childhood. I was I was raised Jewish, but for for my family, that meant uh, going to high holiday services at the Unitarian Church and with our with our Jewish community group and um, making the Jewish foods around holidays. And at the Jewish community center, I I always volunteered. Um, and that's something that I think was very foundational for me. One of my grandmother's was really really an active volunteer and so that that made an impression on me from a young age by the way my my son-in-law is a ham radio aficionado and my daughter when they married they were living in finland for 20 years before they moved back to the states he's a finnish american composer uh, musician and just what was it two three weeks ago he was my daughter jessica came here and she said he's driven up to wherever in Maine or something, there's a ham radio, they're getting together a whole bunch of ham radio people, they do this every year. So Donnie Stromback is my son in law. And if your dad is still into ham radio, it's such a small world, maybe they've talked to each other. (laughs) They probably have. (laughs) It's like, hey, there are phones and you know, all that. Nope, we still do it with ham radio. I'm talking to (laughs) St. Petersburg this afternoon. Yeah, that's an interesting group of people. It, it, it really is. It's fascinating. And and I remember as a kid, my dad would talk to people in different states. And then once they made a connection, they like send each other postcards that have the, your call letters on it. In fact, this is really funny that I have this right within arm's length. But oh, these, I love that. So this is my both my parents' ham radio call letters. Well, I'm going to get Donnie to watch this. I don't know if he ever <laughs> looks at any of our podcasts, but he's watching this one and I'm going to get him to take those call letters and <laughs> check it out. Say, my father-in-law just talked to your daughter. <laughs> but so my dad would get these postcards from all the states. And I, I remember when Alaska and Hawaii came in, it was very exciting at home. It was like time to celebrate. So that's just fabulous. So what was his MOS or job for civilians in the military? He was, um, oh gosh, I'm going to forget this. Um, I'm totally something blanking. Right. Yeah, he, it, it was something like, it was something with radio communications. And, okay, so it was, um, it was related to what he yeah. was doing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and is he nearby now? Is he, is he, uh, or? Yeah, he, he, he and, he and his wife are in Maryland and my mom and her husband are in Maryland. Okay, so the families are on. So yeah. now, getting getting back to your career as a writer, I'm just curious about how you view yourself because when I read your portfolio contact sheet and all that, I'm saying, "Gee, this is one of the most published, most successful writers I know." As a journalist, certainly a commentator, you know, there's not many people who have done as well as you have. Um, how did that all develop? Uh, other than the fact that you write beautifully and you're very talented, as anybody who's been in this field knows, it also takes a little bit of luck and right place at the right time. You did a lot of academic stuff, but so did a lot of other people, and they're not published everywhere and earning a living from their writing. So can you talk about the career aspect and the luck and right time and right place and just steps? Because I think people are so interested in writers there are a lot of people who, you know, have aspirations in that direction. I'm just curious what your writer journey was about in terms of just how you got to where you're at. And do you see yourself as successful? I'll answer that question first. <laughs> um, that's that's a tough one. I, because I'm 
I think writers are always comparing themselves with with other writers. And so I, I think I take my cues a lot from from other people. So if you think I'm successful, <laughs> that makes me feel more successful. If I if people are reading what I write and and writing, you know, and, and taking the time to write to me about their own stories, that feels like a success to me. Mm. And I, I didn't have that for the first probably two thirds of my career because I was writing for little tiny publications and trade magazines and things that that you would never have read um, because I was just I was saying yes to anybody who would hire me, mm. which meant that I was writing a lot of business articles and these trade magazines. You, you would not believe how crazy some of these topics were. I mean, one was called Packaging Machinery Technology. So it was a whole magazine about the machines that put the toothpaste in the tube or the applesauce in the applesauce boxes or the <laughs> pre-sun and the juice drink. So, and, and it was actually really interesting because I love learning how things work and kind of seeing behind the scenes. Um, and the trade magazines paid much better than you know, say a lifestyle, a local mm -hmm. lifestyle magazine. So I started when I was in Atlanta and was there for four years and then moved back to DC and continued freelancing, did a lot of more business writing and for, for business journals. And then I decided to go to graduate school, which there are many successful journalists who don't go to journalism school. And um, for me, it was it was great because I was really self-taught as, as a freelance journalist. I was just learning as I went. And so I got a formal education. I had fantastic teachers, um, Sig Gisler, who was the um, administrator of the Pulitzer Prizes after, after I graduated, and Sam Friedman, who taught an amazing book writing seminar. And, and those things, 20 years later are still still with me. Hmm. And the other really important thing for me about journalism school is the contacts that I made. I think it was a week after graduation and this was in 20 in 2001. So we were there during 9/11 in New York. Um a week after graduation someone forwarded me an email an editor at USA Weekend which was the equivalent of Parade magazine was looking for a writer in Washington. And, mm. and I, I ended up doing the assignment and working with this editor for, for years. And so I just very quickly started getting clips in, in bigger publications and broadening my network and then having more impressive clips to send out to the next editors. But it's, um, you know, it's, it's been it's been challenging the whole time in in certain ways. I mean, there there are some publications I've wanted to write for for many many years, and you send in a pitch and you never hear back, and that's um, you know that's that's why it's really important to have contacts or know other journalists who have written for publications. Mm. So. Um, but it's still freelancing still really suits me. Mm. Definitely not for everybody, but, um, but I like it. I like the variety of topics that I can cover. Um, one of the sections on my website is, I think it's called like the first time, um, my first time, because something that I so enjoy doing is just trying something once. And that's it. I don't need to, I mean, very few of those things have stuck. I did mm. take a motorcycle class and then buy a motorcycle, which I've since sold. <laughs> um, and paddleboarding is the big thing that's stuck. But but I like trying these things and writing about my experience and hoping that that somebody can relate or enjoy the story or go try it themselves. Hmm. Yeah, because the, the list of people you've written for and been published by in a number of times as well is, you know, very impressive to anybody who, you know, you can imagine a younger person who wants to be a journalist or a writer looking at this, and it would be like, well, how do you ever get there? So that's an interesting, you know, the idea of some connections coming out of graduate school. So were you living on the Upper West Side at that time? Mm -hmm. 
So what, up at around 102nd and Broadway, or where were you? Uh, 110. 110, okay. Yep. Yeah, all good. Um, so let me let me just turn the page here a little bit. Um, again, the only reason I'm being so self-referential in this is because I'm interviewing someone who earns their living writing, and I do too, but with me, it's been books. Um, to support that career, I've done quite a bit of speaking on colleges and you know, bookstores and media and so forth. But I'm 70 years old. I'll be 71 uh, in this summer. And I my first novel was published, I think, in 1990. Um, and before that, I had a career in the film business. And then before that, as a nepotistic sidekick to a Christian evangelist. So those are different <laughs> steps. <laughs> no bank robbery yet, but we're trying <laughs> impersonate a neurosurgeon would be the only on my bucket list. Um, <laughs> catch me if you can kind of thing. But the reason I mention this is I've seen huge changes in how I do what I do. I'm not talking about the writing, skill levels, experience, human learning curve, my own life, wisdom, nothing. I mean, just the the tools of the trade and the way that I've done it. You know, when I my first novel, Portofino, was published in 1990. Uh, I think I was reviewed in maybe 68 newspapers, if I remember the last count. And thankfully, they were good reviews. Everybody had a book reviewer or book review section, even some small local papers. Well, newspapers are going away. When I was first published, people wanted to know whether your book would have a blurb by some famous writer or, or what the reviews would be. But nobody asked you what your online following or footprint was. Um, there were publicists who really publicized you and you did bookstore readings and it was a very formal kind of a circuit. All that is going away. Everybody wants to know how many people follow you on Instagram now. All I'm saying is, and none of this can be monetized, by the way. It used to be that if you got on a certain kind of TV show, you could see a bump, your publisher, because there was no Amazon at that time, would tell you a week, few weeks later, oh, we got more. You know, it it gave your book a bump. What I'm asking you is, from journalism school in, in when you were there till now, you also must have seen changes in the how of what you do um, and the number of clients you have potentially because newspapers are sort of not, you know, have you done more online-y stuff? Are you more present and accounted for in that world? Is your publisher for your book coming out next year talking to you about how do we get people to read this as in, you know, what whatever publicity or something they do? How What have you seen change while you've been doing this? Well, of course, of course, a lot has changed. Uh, perhaps the the best indicator as a freelancer is when I started freelancing in Atlanta, there was a publication called Creative Loafing and it was the alternative weekly. I don't know that it exists anymore, but I had to drive. It wasn't, it wasn't a thumb drive. It must've been like a floppy disk. I had to drive a floppy disk with my story down to the editor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when I was sending out clips in the early days, I had to go Xerox them and put them in an envelope and mail them off. And so now that we're in the days of having a website and I can just send an editor my link and I've linked to my clips and that's hugely, um, hugely easier in that case. I, I have definitely, I mean, my friends will tell you very quickly that, that uh, I, I draw a hard and fast line on technology use and and I, I love technology, but I I use it, I hope, um for I, I I think I think that I I have to draw a line for myself because like many people, you know, I would just get sucked in and I, I just know that I I can't do that. So for example, I, I've never owned a smartphone. Um, I'm on I'm on these various social media platforms, but I rarely share. That probably will have to change with the book. But I really just I post my articles and and that's kind of it. So so it's it's possible to do that, but I also don't have the following that 
that many other journalists have. And I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's, you know, I think for my, for my sanity, it's, um, it's something that I really need to limit. Having said that, I, I know plenty of writers who are really active on social media and they have whole communities and people who support them. And, um, you know, just in terms of, of networking and brainstorming and sharing ideas and getting feedback. And that's something that I, I haven't explored much. Yeah, but have you noticed actual publications sort of going away? I'm going to give you one example of something I know personally it happened. I was fortunate enough to be reviewed very favorably a number of times in the Washington Post book review section over the years. And then one year, I think it was uh, the novelist, um, a, a novelist was reviewing a book of mine, a, a writer, a woman, um, and then, you know, when I looked it up, it was in, I guess, what they call lifestyle or the society section. It's like, well, what happened to the book review? Well, it, it went. There isn't a book review. They It's folded into something else, let alone whole papers going out of existence. So of this list of places you'd like to be published, are, are they all going to stick around long enough for you to tick the box? Or wild guess here is the New Yorker or Rolling Stone or the Atlantic or whatever's on your list you haven't gotten to yet. Although I think I've seen you, haven't you published in Rolling Stone? I haven't. Not um, yet. Is that on the list? Um, you know, well, yeah, this is, this is the big question is, is what's happening. I mean, for, for a while, um, the travel section at the post went away and with the pandemic, of course, and I was writing for them pretty regularly and I'm not sure what the future of that looks like, but I know that there's, there's always talk about these sections going away. And as a freelancer, you have no idea what these internal conversations look like. So there's, there's been many times that I've written for publication and then, and then it, it just goes away. Mm -hmm. Um, So. Well, I've never, I've never read anything of yours on a piece of paper. (laughs) <laughs> and that's not on purpose, but I just, you yeah. know, I, re- I read the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Guardian, um, the Daily Mail, the Atlantic and the New Yorker every day. Not that the New Yorker is a daily paper, but but they're all online now. My my wife, Jeannie, you know, we still get the New Yorker in hard copy. She likes to read it on a piece of paper, but I, I you know, now I'm totally there. So when it comes to print media, and these newspapers going away that used to review books. I don't feel the impact of that as much, but I do whenever I publish a book mm. because it's like, well, how's anybody going to find out about this thing? Right. I know the the disappearance of the book sections is really sad. Well, it, well, it, it sort of goes with the disappearance of the local bookstore too. So the the machinery of selling books is is hasn't gone away, but it it you know, it isn't the same. I mean, getting a bunch of starred reviews on Amazon is a different kind of an animal, but it's not the same as going to a reading in Albuquerque, New Mexico, in a famed local bookstore that does readings and events, and you've been reviewed in the local paper, and then a local radio station has interviewed you the day you arrived. It's just very, very different. Do you you have a good local bookstore near you? Yes, we do. We the Jabberwocky, Newburyport, Massachusetts. I'm a faithful mm-hmm. client. They, you know, and I always try to do an event there and other places like that. But, you know, years ago it became the kind of Barnes and Noble thing, and then there were places like what's the one in Washington that I did a thing. Um, it's the famous bookstore. I did a couple of events there. Politics and prose. Yes, politics and prose. I've been there a number of times, and after the Washington Post reviewed, um, Jane Smiley gave a very nice review of one of my books. Um, Sex Mom and God, I think it was. And I did a politics and prose thing, I think. But, you know, that world has sort of gone away. And publishers used to even pay for travel for things. And they'd say, oh, well, while you're there, you know, you should do a book TV event and we'll get them there. And then you'd go to book TV and then you'd go down there to that building. I forget the street it's on in Washington. It's just across from when you come out of the main entrance of, is it Union Station? What's the station? Union station, the train. Yeah, yeah. And you walk yeah. down the street and then CNN was in there, yeah. and book TV, all those guys. But, you know, now half, I mean, it's all on Zoom anyway. Nobody takes you anywhere to do anything. Um, 
it's just very, very different. And I'm not disconcerted by it, but it, I'm glad I'm not trying to do a first book now mm. and make a living at it. I mean, you're you're very well established as a journalistic writer, so your world isn't going away. But, uh, you know, the book world used to be very hands on. I mean, books, they were things, you know, you had you got sent galleys and the editing was all by hand and they put little post-its in the thing and that's all it's all different now anyway i'm rambling about that I, me... I i still get excited about seeing you know something in print like in a real newspaper or i mean the book's gonna be very exciting for me yeah. and i you know I've, I've certainly written for publications that are only online but i'm i'm still a big big believer in print. So yeah, me too. Hey, let me let me just reintroduce you. This is Frank Schaefer in conversation with Frank Schaefer, my podcast. And I'm talking to Melanie DG Kaplan, who in my view, I was asking her if she feels successful in my view is one of the most successful freelance journalists in America, because she does really beautiful writing and keeps getting published by these fabulous places that everybody would like to be published by like the New York Times and the Washington Post. I want to change the subject a little bit. And pass on a question for my producer, Ernie, who is, would love to know your view on AI entering the creative arts. Ooh. I'm not, we're not asking you to tell us anything you don't want to tell us, but we're just Ernie's <laughs> curious. And I think it's a good subject because I know nothing about this, but I keep hearing about it. What do you know and what do you think? Right. Um I, I really have not used it. Uh, several of my friends have used it. So we've we've talked about it a lot. And I've listened to interviews with with uh, journalists who are experts in this now. I think probably because I don't know too much about it. I don't feel I don't feel threatened or scared, but I do know um, it's it's really it's huge. I mean, there's no, there's no turning back, you know, um, I used to write about geospatial intelligence and so machine learning and AI were, were a big part of that. And it's something that for years ago, um, people who are experts in this area have been, have been concerned about the potential. And so I, I think I'm just trying to do what I do and, and not, um, yeah, I, I mean, I am not, um, just kind of see how, how it plays out. I mean, obviously there are a lot of really big questions that need to be answered in terms of how it's used in schools and the, um, and just the, the potential for it to think of potential for the, the fake news and for people to you know, really be tricked, which is a little scary. Mm. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot there that, that I probably will learn and dive into a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm kind of there too, because I, I don't know much about it, but it certainly, put it this way, I don't think the track record and the, the, the kind of hyped, optimistic promise of, tech and online life and you don't you have a you don't have a smartphone so we sort of know where your head's at on that but <laughs> it certainly hasn't been lived up to when you push back 20 years and everything that was going to be changed and be so wonderful um and the way the algorithms have been built to kind of hook people on you know scrolling endlessly and so on really one thing that i think it impacts your writing deeply and mine unintentionally is that i don't know whether you have calibrated the way you're writing at all to a, a readership, a younger readership who literally do not have an attention span or a physical way of reading that we assumed people used to have. You know, I labor over a sentence or a paragraph and I'll do 20 drafts of a book. And there are times when I really, I enjoy it and I'm patient for that. So I would do it for myself. Uh, but there are times when I'm saying, wow, I hope the person who reads my book is reading it as deeply as I'm writing it and not doing what I do when I skim a piece in the newspaper because I'm covering all this material because I do social commentary. I'm not really reading the articles. I read yours because I like the writing and you're not writing that kind of article. But I skim news pieces all the time where somebody 
took all that trouble to write, but I'm reading the way modern reader does today. I, I'm, I know that my concentration level, because of the volume of the online material I cover and just the way it's delivered, has changed the way I see things. And I'm 70. So God only knows what right. some 14 year old, how a 14 year old who happens to be interested in dogs and first comes across your writing in an article or reads your book, how is she going to, you know, you know, she's not reading it the way your dad would. Right. Well, what do you think well, about that? Maybe, maybe she'll be listening to it. Yeah, that would be good. Yes. Do you, do you, do you listen to books on? I do. I do. In fact, my wife, uh, Jeannie, um, you know, one of the ways we listen is, you know, we we listen to a lot of Mary Beard's books. She doesn't read them herself, unfortunately. A few she has, but most books on Roman history, SPQR, and these other wonderful books she's written are read by other good readers, you know, Sir John Gilgood or whatever, not by him, but another woman reader. And then we will revisit books we've always loved, you know, be that Alice in Wonderland or Through the Looking Glass, whatever, with some reading voice we love. I like Sir Stephen Fry. I think he's one of the best readers around. He has a fabulous command of the English language, but also in addition to which I love Fry's American accent, which is unusual for a British reader. But when he does Arthur Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes stories and you have an, a, an American character, for instance, the guy who inherits the, the house in The Hound of the Baskervilles, who comes from the States or Canada, I forget which, but he does a great American accent. But anyway, we 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 have fallen in love with a lot of readers like Fry, who have made a career. I mean, he does many other things, but how about you? Do you listen to books? You know, I, I don't. I listen to a lot of podcasts and I, I've i gotten in the habit of listening to them at one and a quarter speed. So I feel like I'm being super productive because <laughs> mm -hmm. they're just a slightly faster, but it doesn't really, you can barely tell. Um, but I haven't, I haven't listened to books, um, audio books. Although I think that I, I was talking to a cousin recently and, and she, that's all she does, listens to books and versus reading them. And, and I guess people who do that talk about it in terms of the hours. So they don't mm. say it's a 300 page book. They say it's a 32 hour book. Yeah. I have people who listen to my books and I've, I've been asked by publishers to read my own work sometimes. And I have, it's quite, quite a job. Um, I think I would do it again in the future because I do, there's a guy lives on my street who comes up to me and asks me if I'm writing something new. And he listens to all my, my books and tells me to make sure to read it myself next time. Cause he listened to one that was narrated by someone else. And he says to me, it's not nearly as interesting because <laughs> I know that he didn't write it. You know, not that I pretend to be, I, I, Jeannie and I just listened to a, a very interesting book by Richard E. Grant, the actor, um, the British actor with Null and I, and he was Oscar nominated for a movie a few years ago. He had a, his wife of 38 years died and he wrote a, book shortly after her death on loss very well done and and it was an unusual thing because the subject was so tender and poignant and then he uh, wasn't putting on his emotion but he read it with the emotion of the loss so it was riveting and he's a you know he's a really good actor but um that's the last one i think we listened to together but yeah, they do talk about it. Like, and this guy that lives down the street was listening to a book of mine and telling me he drives up to Maine all the time and how many drives it took there and back. To... <laughs> so it was like, <laughs> you know, five, five round trips. I mean, you, it was a five round trip book. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so when yeah. we talked before, you mentioned that I think it's your grandson is studying composting. Yes, in fact, he's, wanting, he's now helping to manage. <laughs> yeah, com he's studying composting. Ben, my son, is studying composting. And more information than you need. Next week, we are going to his wedding. He is marrying Claire, who comes from a small village in France. And we're going to go over there to that. Um, but Ben went to college in Holland, having grown up in the European Union in, in Finland, and studied um you know, new farming techniques and composting, wrote some sort of essay or or thing on composting, but now has wound up um, running one farm while advising and helping some new investors who are trying to do 
what's it's not just organic farming it's what's called regenerative farming where you're taking pieces of land that essentially have been ruined by by the way they have been farmed or left uh in some condition and you bring them back um there's a wonderful documentary out uh the biggest little farm i think it's called about a california couple that did this maybe 15 20 years ago um and he he does that and is now managing through helping to manage three farms that are in various stages of regenerative farming plus working on his own farm and the Isn't big that a beautiful movie week, yeah yeah, that, yeah that. it's a wonderful movie and last yeah. week they got i think six cows on one of these things you know they're starting to do something so it's a wonderful thing to keep up with his wife works in a very different field but i don't know anything about it on the scientific side but on the family side we're involved with all that. Well, I love that because I'm I'm a big composting fan. And since we talked, some exciting news. I, I am now part of the pilot program in DC for curbside compost pickup. Wow. So, um, and what's we, happening to your compost? Where is it going? Oh, good question. I'm going to have to get back to you on that. <laughs> I mean, but I mean has, when they pick up your compost, how composted is it? Are you just talking about like oh, well, the food comp- It's so, so I have been, there's several places in DC where you can drop off food scraps. And so I do that every week, but they're starting this program where they, they pick up food scraps. I think it's a thousand people in each of the city's quadrants. So, so I applied for it and I was selected. And so when it starts the end of the summer, I will get a bin and I can leave my food scraps in it and then I'll get picked up, I think once a week. And then maybe once a year they bring back some of the processed compost for me to use in my garden. But I've visited so many cities that have this, this uh, food scrap pickup and, and it's great because, you know, it goes into gardens eventually and the trash is so much smaller. I mean, I can yeah. you know, take, well, take I, a, I, I, have a trash bag. I have a compost heat uh, thing right next to where my vegetable garden is right out there. And this is the fifth year I've done it. Um, and I dig it out about every two years and then dig it into the garden. But it, it works very well, you know, just on a, on a little individual basis. But I think that's terrific. You, Ernie was mentioning that in Europe, they ha- they're adamant about separating everything because, of course, it ruins the whole thing if there's stuff in the compost that shouldn't be. Right. So are you having have they told you you have to be very careful? Yeah, I've been I've been collecting food scraps to for to drop off for years now. So I kind of know um what goes in there. And you know, I'm just I eat entirely plant-based at home. So it's just all the vegetables. And you can also throw in things like um, depending on the composting system, I throw in things like tubes from toilet paper and paper towels or napkins. Um, you could put in coffee grinds, you can put in um, tea bags. So, but you do have to make sure if you put in a tea bag that the little staple from the tea bag, if there is one, doesn't go in there. But, yeah, and of course now the whole thing is composting human remains, but not, I guess, curbside yet. Not curbside yet. <laughs> it's not quite. It's not sort of plague. Bring out your dead time, but you know we'll, we'll get there eventually. Just ring the bell and have a horse cart. Bring out. <laughs> I mean, you know, we want to go to something really simple. Why not? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you, I read about this and it's a shallow grave and they wrap you in a straw mat of some sort and they put wood chips around you and you're gone in what, two years? Two two yeah. years seems like a long time, doesn't it? Yeah, but I mean, you know, there's bones left. In Greece, they've always done that. They they shallow grave you. I saw all these bones on Manathos at the monastery um, when I visited there oh, 20, 30 years ago. And they bury them for two years in a sandy grave, foot and a half down, and dig them up and then stack the bones. Mm. And if it's a family member in Greece, after they dig you up, there's no old, you know, graveyards that way. They wash the bones in wine and put them in a box, an ossuary box in the house, the way some people in America keep ashes. Yeah. And burn. Wow, I really like that, actually. Yeah. So, you know, the cult, you, there's an article there, by yeah. the way. <laughs> <laughs> say hey americans aren't the first people to compost people this is the way it's done <laughs> maybe you've written one about it that seems like a melanie yeah that does Kaplan seem like subject i mean i could see you doing that 
people always say, well, where do your ideas come from? And so I will remember this is, I will give you credit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This Frank Schaefer said I should write on composting process of burial in Greece. Composting body. Uh, it is. And we didn't invent this. So yeah. So the composting thing, he does that. And my daughter, Jessica works for a, a, an investment company that um, guides local communities and and selectmen and people like that into alternative green energy forms to supplement being part of the grid. So they both between the, that group and my family are both very, uh, you know, very much in on the right side of history when it comes to conservation and that sort of thing. And I know you've done some writing about that in, in your traveling, speaking of not doing causes so much, but it seems a lot of your stuff has to do with uh, subjects that, you know, not just how you treat animals, but um, your consciousness of the country. Has that led you into, some, besides the composting interest, into kind of the environmental things? Have you been writing about that? Um, I have a little bit. You know, it, it comes, I mean, there's, I guess there's different ways to write about it. I've I've covered some endangered species issue, issues for I wrote for Georgetown Law Magazine years ago and and you know I've written about trash pickups how to volunteer this was a pandemic thing so people were looking for activities to get outside and volunteer where they weren't breathing the same air um so wrote about trash pickups in the area and um, you know, a lot, a lot of publications want service oriented pieces now. So, you know, they want people, readers to be able to look at it and say, okay, here's, here's how I can do it. And here are the steps. And so I recently wrote about, you know, what to do with your old batteries and your old other hazardous materials and old medications. And which was actually really helpful because I had, I had a medicine closet filled with not filled, but um, with many old, very old prescription medications and realize that they had expire after a year and I need to get rid of these things. And so that's how, that's how a lot of my stories come about. I experience something and mm. decide, oh, this is something I need to write about. So, mm. Hey, I take very old Motrin. Okay. <laughs> I never read. I, I don't know what bottle it's out of, but I'm like you, it's like, oh, it'll probably still do something. <laughs> Give it a shot. Well, the problem with these is they were, it was, it was after the surgery. And so they were, they were much stronger than Motrin. And yeah. I later, later found out from, um, you know, the, the agencies that you are not to keep these in your house after they, after they expire. And mm. you know, so, well, you anyway. know, I've had a couple of different surgeries and the last one I had was on my knee and they sent me home with two strong pills and then said, well, Tylenol will do it after that. And it did not. And I was on the <laughs> phone saying, look, you know, I'm pushing 70. I'm not a drug addict. I've had other surgeries and I'm not drug dependent and I'm not, you know, the opioids never touch me that way. You have to prescribe more. How, how did that just, go over? I, I, I got another three pills or something, you know, so I could get three more nights sleep, but it was, it's, it was not enough. They kind of, you know, ran scared because of all the stuff about the opioid crisis, which is all real enough. But yeah, at a certain point, if they're sending you home with it, after knee surgery and you can't make it from the car to the living room because it's worn off after the one hour drive. It's like, are you kidding me? Yeah. That, that pain is just, mm -hmm. that pain's brutal. So I have a question. Do, do editors contact you and say, Hey, listen, we we'd like you to write something or do you come to them with ideas? Mm, um, both more the latter though. It's always, it's always nice when somebody reaches out to me. Yeah, and commissions you says okay. We were, would you please write around about um, whatever it may be? Yeah. Let me finish up just where we started in terms of your your dog uh, as your co pilots, so to speak. Um, Hammy's getting old now. Isn't he's that correct? he's fourteen in September. Yeah. So, and you got him when he was what six? Four. Four. Sorry. Yeah couldn't remember. And um, is he doing okay? He is. He is. He's curled up next to my desk right now. Good. And uh, how is Zip? Zip is doing great. Um, I, I We've had such nice things. I 
he was so sweet to me yes, last night again because Jeannie and I lost a very old friend yesterday who had had heart surgery and and passed away a week later when, you know, very shockingly. So Zip knew. It was just crazy. I woke up in the middle of the night feeling kind of distraught. Um, and his manner was completely different. I mean, it's hard to describe, but you know what I'm talking about. Dogs understand stuff. And he was very solicitous and very you know, trying to see what was wrong with me, giving me long, hard looks, not just because I was up, but you could tell he could sense something Aww. was happening. I don't think people who haven't had a close relationship with a dog get what you're talking about, but I'm sure you do. Um, but it was quite something. It was so kind. Um, they they know. Yeah, they know. Sorry, something's I'm sorry to hear quite... about your friend. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Terrible, terrible thing. But yeah. Uh, but no, thank goodness we have these these animals with us. And Hammy's, uh, you know, at night now, he kind of goes between my room and another room. And when he decides to sleep in bed with me, it's always a treat. I feel like, you know, it just feels like such a gift. And I cherish every one of those nights. So Does he get under the covers? Um, not so much this time of year, but he, he does like being under the covers and he has a bed. That's one of these cave beds. It looks like when he's in, it, it looks like he's in a pita. Um, and, and he just climbs right in. So, yeah, that's what zip does. He climbs right down and has his little position. He puts his gets down. He likes being scissored and he puts his <laughs> chin on my left ankle and his paws <laughs> over one thing and then pushes with his back paws against my inner leg you know, above the knee and then just locks himself in there. And then that's it. You and know, then you I can't to, move. <laughs> and then I can't move. And then if I, and then I'm lying there thinking I've got to turn over, you know, I'm starting to, <laughs> and, and then I do. And we totally, re, and then he does it. And then he rearranges himself and settles back again. <laughs> but it's, it's quite something, you know, he doesn't bother. I try not to disturb him, but it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so, anyway, nice place to finish up. Um, so in conversation with Frank Schaefer, this is my podcast and please like it and share it. And I've been talking with someone who um, I feel I know through her writing. Uh, I love your writing. And Melanie D. D. G. Kaplan is a journalist who writes for all the people like the New York Times and the Washington Post and others. We didn't actually get the names of the people who haven't called you back yet. Uh, <laughs> you wanted to write for, <laughs> you know who you are. Uh, and we're coming for you, you know, we right. They're out there. I mean, just remember the cancel culture, you know, we'll push the button. <laughs> You'll be gone by next Thursday, unless you get her to write an article for you. But well, uh, real enough. pleasure. And I love your writing and I love you as you come through in your writing. You're just lovely. And the, the writing is, is beautiful and superb. And your book is going to be a huge hit because you're such a good writer, whatever the, your publisher, who is the publisher, by the way? Um, I'll tell you that next time too. Okay. We're, we'll find <laughs> out who the publisher is and we'll find out what the book is about, but it's going to be wonderful because yeah. I, I know you write beautifully. So, well, thank this has just been such a treat to talk to a, a fellow writer and someone who's, who's equally thoughtful about dogs and um, all of these topics. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. And listen, stay in touch with Ernie, my producer and me, please. Tell us what you're doing. Make sure we're in on the first circle with the book and we'll we'll pull out all the stops. And before that, if there's something you want to talk about, uh, we'd love to again, because this was such a pleasure. Likewise, I will do that. Thank, Thank you, you, Melanie. Thanks, Frank. Bye. Bye.